Hello, this is Shit You Didn't Know. I'm Logan. And I'm Corey. Um, so, the we're going to do the hipster beer of the week is, again, Summer Ale Crisp Wheat Ale with Citrus by Sam Adams. It's pretty good. 5.3% alcohol. Uh, it's labeled as a summer beer, but, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you can drink it all year, right? Yep. Yep. Because fuck all the other seasonal stuff they try. I know, right? <laughs> Actually put that for into. What is the winter beer? Have you ever had a winter beer? Is that just Guinness? I feel like it's just like, has like cinnamon and apple flavor. Maybe some syphilis. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, because alcohol is definitely not going to keep you warm, but the syphilis <coughs> will. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't stay awake in this section of the country without my syphilis scars. At least it's not a smallpox blanket. Yeah. <laughs> Just a syphilis beer. Uh, so, um, forewarned, this, um, this is not going to be an episode with a happy ending. Yay <laughs> for no happy endings! <laughs> Those are always the most interesting. I'd say it's neutral. You know, it's up to you objectively if you think it's a happy it's a happy ending, but I don't personally think it's a happy ending. But I do think you'd be happy if you just believe hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> right. on that note, <laughs> so um, Marty Bergen was born on October twenty fifth, eighteen seventy one, in North Brookfield, Massachusetts, uh, to Michael and Ann Bergen, Irish immigrants who immigrated to Boston in eighteen sixty five. Marty was the third of six children and the first of two boys. For an Irish Catholic family, they only have six kids. Fucking slackers. Right. They're supposed to breed like rabbits. So um, Not quite like Mormons. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, North Brookfield was a small town 75 miles west of Boston and a largely ideal place for a young boy to grow up. And as he grew up, Marty became obsessed with baseball, and he played on independent teams as a small boy. As a team, he played on a, as a teen, he, that was hard to say, as a teen, he played on a team called the Brookfields, with fellow North Brookfield native and future Hall of Famer, Connie Mack. I don't know if anybody knows who Connie Mack is. He's one of the most famous managers in baseball history. He literally managed a team for 50 years. I know that seems insane. <laughs> he plays, That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, he... Seriously, 50 years. Um, and he's a, he's a Hall of Famer. He's probably the most famous manager, one of the most famous managers that was ever in baseball. But, yeah, he was neighbors to this guy. Um, so in 1892, Bergen proved to be so good that he joined a team in the New England League, his first professional club. The next year, he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Pirates, who were managed by his friend Connie Mack. That year, Bergen met Hattie Gaines, who worked at a local mill in North Brookfield, and they were soon married. They would eventually have three children, Marty Jr., Florence, and Joseph. In 1894, Bergen was sent to Lewis Lewiston in the New England League to develop his skills. He hit 321 and was the best catcher in the league. He was then drafted by the Kansas City Cowboys in 1895. However, the Kansas City manager soon became exasperated with Bergen. Marty was described as moody, paranoid, and prone to bouts of severe melancholia. At one point in midseason, Marty simply walked away from the team over a perceived slight, and then calmly came back a week later as if nothing happened. That year, he batted 372 and scored 118 runs, all while being the league's best catcher. So despite this, the Kansas City club simply could not deal with him personally, and he did not get along with his teammates. So he must have been a fucking dick if he was batting like that and doing that, and he was the best catcher. And for years, I found this out that catchers behind the plate did not use gloves, <laughs> as they as they no. are uh, designed today. They uh, no when, wonder he hated himself. <laughs> He's like the only position I did is a fucking catcher. <laughs> well, they would wear like uh, it kind of works like it looks like work gloves. They would kind of wear those, okay. but they wouldn't wear the gloves you would know as today, no, yeah. at least in the beginning of Thank the eighteen hundreds. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> Imagine getting hit with a bat, but with the oh yeah, god! I mean, like, I mean, professional still uses only wood, but imagine like 
playing with a friend, all of a sudden he brings it, like, he pulls a sandlot, just brings it a little bit that. He's like, I got this, but they don't have gloves for catchers yet, so fuck her up, buttercup. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's coming for you. Like, no. So, um, yeah, so Kansas City, they just couldn't deal with him. He, you know, the severe melancholia, and he's just moody. Um, so he was sold the next year to the Boston <coughs> Bean Eaters. Yes, that is a team, the Boston Bean Eaters. <laughs> I'm not making that up. What what kind of meaning is that? What 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 do we call ourselves? Um, I don't know. Maybe the Patriots. Maybe the Red Sox. No, no, no. You, you're getting it all wrong. Bean eaters. What if they just had a hell of a sponsor from Boston Baked Beans? <laughs> That's possible. Right. So, the owner of the Bean Eaters, Arthur Soden, knowing that Marty Marty was sensitive and moody made a trip to North Brookfield to personally assure Marty that he would be treated fairly by the club and that his teammates would like him. That does not happen now. <laughs> Never happens now. No, most of the time when you join something, they're like, okay, these people, they can be nice, but just be careful. <laughs> like, you never hear, oh, everyone's so great. It's like, maybe the manager or the head person will tell you that, but everyone else will say, yeah, they're all assholes. We're well, all assholes. Well, now they have, to the team. they have sports agents now that do everything for them. So <laughs> they, don't, they don't have to do any of this. It's just weird to think of an owner like actually yeah. taking the train to a guy's house and like, we want hey, you. man, I want you to play for my team. I know you're a fucking dick. <laughs> I'm willing to do that. So um, during the next four years, his reputation as the best catcher in baseball only grew. Connie Mack remarked that Marty Bergen was the only man I've ever seen throw out a runner at second from his knees, which is fucking crazy <laughs> that's what the fuck yeah that's a windmill arm I, I I don't know if anyone has ever tried to throw a baseball from their knees but you can throw out a guy like that I mean that's pretty fucking spectacular but Marty was not getting along with his teammates his behavior only became worse and as a teenager Marty had shown signs of anxiety and stress and um, he would become moody and pout if he didn't get the applause from the crowd that he thought he deserved when he made a good play on the baseball diamond too bad this team wasn't in Canada. Like. <laughs> <laughs> there is a cure for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, in his first professional season in 1892, Marty had gotten into a brutal fist fight with a teammate after an argument. And the other player ended up quitting because he just didn't want to deal with it anymore. He's like, fuck you, I'm not dealing with this. So, um, as he played with Boston, uh, he kept getting a worse and worse relationship with his teammates. And by the end of the 1898 season, Bergen threatened his teammates after an altercation on the bench. He declared that he would club them to death with a bat at the end of the season. What the fuck, man? <laughs> oh so, at least he didn't follow up with, I don't make idle threats. <laughs> like, you're either go 50 50, I can piss this dude off and be fine, or I'm gonna have kept me. Like, dude, oh, this guy. So, uh, in another incident, he slapped pitcher Vic Willis in a St. Louis hotel room unprompted after Willis sat down at the same table as him. Hey, can't sit here. <laughs> <laughs> if you ain't a catch, you can't sit here. But we only have one catch. That's the point. <laughs> So, on top of all this, he would also frequently leave the team unannounced and go to his farm in Massachusetts with his family. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would return unannounced. <laughs> so, I'm back, guys. Chickens are good. Let's play. <laughs> once, <Fuck you. laughs> so, once the team was traveling to a game from Cincinnati, in, in Cincinnati, they were going to Cincinnati, and the men on the train were laughing, drinking, and playing cards while Marty sat brooding in a nearby seat. Then when the train stopped in Washington, D.C., he probably got off the train and went to his farm in Massachusetts and didn't bother to tell the 8-1. So he just fucking left. They just have Hemingway playing for them. <laughs> yeah. Like, he really... <laughs> he does not go through Maybe with without the Russian spy conspiracy, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, a Boston Globe reporter, Tim Murnane, then went to Marty's farm in North Brookfield in order to coax him into returning to the team. Marty complained to Murnang that his teammates were avoiding him and plotting something behind his back, and that his manager wouldn't give him a day off to visit his family. He was also angered by the $300 fine imposed of him for his frequent disappearances. So how can you be mad at that? You keep leaving. But then on April 24th, 1899, tragedy struck the Bergen household. Marty's oldest son, Marty Jr., died of diphtheria while his father was out of town playing a game. 
Marty spiraled into a dark mood and felt guilty for not being there for his son while he was sick. He was given time off to go see his family, but then returned two weeks later to play. I was just slapping my teammates, and then my son died. <laughs> What's wrong with this world? <laughs> it all goes by so fast. So, um, he, quickly, he quickly sank into a downward spiral, and he started seeing hallucinations and hearing voices in his head. It's probably not good if you're playing on a baseball field. <laughs> just so you know, I am on the pivot now. No one's talking. Fuck you! <laughs> Having an argument with the voice in his head after his like, entire team. <laughs> Once in a game, he didn't catch several balls because he said a man came toward him with a knife to attack him. He saw it. Like, he, he hallucinated it while he was behind the plate. So imagine you're a pitcher and you're like, all right, I got three and one on this guy. Runner on third. If I get him out, I'm all right. Here's the pitch. What the fuck, man? <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> so, uh, towards the end of the season, he suffered a hip injury that proved to be debilitating and threatened his career. As the season ended, many... The business did it. Right, yeah. They just, you know, you broke your hip, and you go to the doctor back then, they're like, uh, can you put, like, you know, maybe some kind of brace in it, or maybe reconstruct it? No. Nah, here's some heroin. <laughs> Good luck. So... <laughs> Have a Coke. <laughs> so, um, at the end of the season, many players asked that either Boston trade Bergen or arrange for themselves to be traded. They just couldn't put up with him anymore, no matter how good he was. He was really good, but, you know, he, he's a dick. Um, so, after the end of the season, Marty went back to his farm and began talking to his friend and personal physician, Dr. Louis Dion. He told Dion he was acting wild and frantic, that he was having strange ideas, and that he was not right in the head. He also told Dion he was in constant fear of being shot, stabbed, or poisoned. All the time. So he's fucking Vladimir Putin, apparently. <laughs> Except it's not realistic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he was afraid that his wife would poison him as well. And initially, he refused to take any medicine because he thought it might be poisonous. He was not taking medication, and yeah. Original anti-vaccine. Right. <laughs> don't he, do it. It's got poison. <laughs> it's got poison in it. You don't. Nobody gets whooping cough anymore. You don't need that. <laughs> mumps. No, you don't got to worry about mumps. You got to worry about everyone else. <laughs> so, he described being afraid of his teammates, and that he would sit sideways. When someone was around him so that he could see if they tried to attack him. Fucking, this sounds, it sounds like well, he was... I mean, he did slap him. It's only, like, right if one of them, like, feels slighted. It sounds like he's doing coke. <laughs> he's so fucking paranoid. So, Dr. Dion prescribed him bromide, which was widely used as a sedative, sedative at the time. Yeah, but I, it apparently didn't work. So, he really, what he needed was heroin. Right? He's on coke. All right. Make him a batter and just let him run. <laughs> Give him some heroin. He'll, he'll go to he'll, sleep. He'll run right past that ball. He'll chase that dragon all night long. Yeah, that's after the game. That's recovery. <laughs> so, he also told uh, Bergen to stop using tobacco as it increased anxiety and nervousness. So doctor's kind of on to something. So Marty then went another route and he talked to a priest. And he told him that he believed himself insane and feared what he might do. The priest told him to pray. <laughs> So he's got nothing. <laughs> Ten Hill Mary's and our Lord and Savior, and then the old beach. Not on the list. Uh, just pray about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's pray. So uh, on the morning of January nineteenth, nineteen hundred, Marty awoke and uh, began to pray, prepare for the day to heat the house. He went outside with his axe and he chopped some wood for, for the stove in his home. After cutting the wood with an axe and putting it into the stove, he turned to the bedroom where he saw his wife sleeping. He struck his wife three times with the blunt end of the axe, killing her. What the fuck? Then his three-year-old son, Joseph, came out of his room, and Marty struck him with the sharp end of the axe, killing him, too. Oh, God. Then his daughter, Florence, came running into the kitchen, screaming, and he struck her with the blunt side of the axe, killing her. Then Marty <laughs> grabbed a straight razor, looked into the mirror in the kitchen, and sliced his own throat. He did it with such force that he almost decapitated himself. 
My first but. thought is, you, I mean, this is fucked all the way around, but you see the first two members of your family, like, just go down. You do not run and scream in front of this guy's line of vision. No. No. <laughs> it's, it's hard to laugh at. It's so fucked up, but it is, the, it's, but yeah, no, it's... We all have our coping mechanisms. <laughs> yeah. So the next morning, uh, Bergen's father opened the door to see the gruesome scene and called the sheriff. Um, which, God. Um, Bergen's behavior had largely been known to the press, but the public was largely in the dark about it. So it became an even bigger shock to Boston fans in the baseball world. Several doctors diagnosed Marty Bergen as a schizophrenic with manic depression. It's probable that he heard voices telling him to kill his family. Or, or that he just snapped. Um, alcohol was not involved because Bergen was known to be a teetotaler. Uh, despite the grisly murders, a funeral was held for Marty Bergen on January 28th, but only Connie Mack and Boston center fielder William Hamilton showed up. Although Bergen's death overshadowed his playing career, he is still regarded as the best 19th century catcher in baseball, and he received... He received votes in the Hall of Fame in 1938, although he's never been inducted. So, happy ending. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I, I, I take back my, if you believe hard enough, comment. <laughs> no, it's, it's just fucked. It really is. But anyway. Thank um, God for mental health awareness now. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, this wouldn't have happened. They would have given him medication now. That's the fucked up part. I would have admitted it. I don't know. It's it's you know guys like this. It's really hard because yeah, maybe he snapped and realized what he did and then killed himself because like that woman in Houston that drowned her kids, she didn't kill herself. She said the same thing. God told her to kill him. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they, he would at least be like dosed up with lithium. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry to end that on a down note. Um, we hope you enjoyed the first 15 minutes of it. <laughs> I didn't get too personally invested into the characters. Kind of like Game of Thrones. Um, uh, and I'm signing off. Uh, it's been fun. This is Corey. This is Logan. And like and subscribe, please. Thank you.